they were too confident, too relaxed, and um, it turned out, and on, on TV, there, there were three channels in Moscow at the time, and they, one was usually Vremya, the news, and one was sort of usually, I think, folk dancing, um, and one was usually some heavy equipment tractor convention or something, doing a piece on And I turned on the TV that morning, and every channel had the Nutcracker Suite. And indeed, it was indicative of the time, and I went to work, and uh, we were shooting and doing the chase stuff, and I was doing, as usual, doing my stunts, which I loved to do. I was also stunt coordinator on the film, which was sort of cool, because it meant that I had a 50-man stunt team, all of whom were like this, and they were my babies, and I was Papa. <laughs> um, and uh, we were the baddest boys in town. I mean, nobody messed with us. <laughs> Can you imagine being 50 guys this tall around me? I'm not even Papa. Anyway. Um, so we got to work, and these tanks started coming in down the, the, the side streets and stuff. And I had a real bad feeling. When there's armor in the street, push has come to shove. And a little 16-year-old Russian trainee that we had, threw a bullhorn, I'll never forget, walked through, with holding a mini mouse stuffed doll by the foot, and talking into a bullhorn, walking toward the tanks, going, we have the square until five. We have the square until five. <laughs> and I went up to her very quietly and said, Mashinka, look, the treads are tearing up the cobblestones. It's not a parade. <laughs> and we got out of there. And actually, we went, uh, we didn't actually uh, run at that point. We changed locations for the sort of idiocy of the show must go on, sort of foremost in our minds. And went to the Cemetery of the Heroes in Moscow, where there's the grave of Yuri Gagarin and Khrushchev. And actually, I filmed um, uh, a segment for uh, Entertainment Tonight. And I'm embarrassed to say, because it was sort of a tacky thing to do in retrospect, especially since this kid just became an American citizen. But I did indeed dance on the grave of the man who counted his shoe and said, you will destroy him. <laughs> it was a little dance. Um, and one of, one of my babies, um, Sergei, or Seriosh, as he was called, came to me and went, Baba, come book. <laughs> and we went, and there was like a little hidden door behind a bush, and this, the cemetery was surrounded by about a 15-foot cement wall. And we looked, and there were tanks all around us. And we were the only Americans in Moscow at that point, really. I mean, only American film crew. Um, and he said, Papa, we go now. <laughs> no, actually, he said, Papa. <laughs> and I said, yes, baby, we don't know. <laughs> and um, we did, and we repaired back to the hotel, actually, and uh, we had to... All our walkie-talkies were confiscated by the, the um, KGB, um, and uh, then returned to us, so we knew that they'd taken the frequencies off them and, and were monitoring any conversations we had. So we used a combination of soul talk, uh, tracker slang, uh, you know, every, everything we could. And we all had different um, handles, thank you. I'm a little teapot. And mine, mine, because I spoke, it was a multinational crew, and I'd done a lot of work in Europe over the years. Um, and I spoke more languages than anybody, because I kind of grew up that way. Um, and so I was the one, whenever there was a problem, would sort of speak to the French segment of the crew, and the German, and the Spanish, and the Russian. And after 11, and I was, whenever I go on a location, the first thing, uh, the first day, I'd say, how do you say please and thank you, how do you say good night, good morning, whatever. And in this case, after quite a few months, we were, I was there for 11 months overall, um, I was pretty conversational in Russian. And love the language, it's a beautiful language to speak. Marshal Bakanyeti, I think you a it's really a luscious, I mean, it feels good in your mouth. If you're um, and stop. Don't go there. You go there with David, not with me. I'm Papa. Um, and so I actually started Radio Free Siberia. This is the first time that I'm making this public knowledge. Um, but what we were so desperately, and boredom, I can tell you, is one of the most dangerous things you can imagine. But we were still very snowed in in Siberia, and we were there for quite a while. 
above the Arctic Circle. And the folks were starting to get a little raggedy around the hem. You know? um, and a couple of fries showed a Happy Meal, so to speak. <laughs> and um, so what I started doing was in the morning, I'd tape my walkie-talkie on. And I'd do like a DJ and play songs and dedicate to whatever mischief was going on, you know, the, the night before. I'd sort of, you know, and this is for Sergey and Jane when a band once a month. <laughs> Coming to you from Radio Free Saturday. Good morning, that is. <laughs> um, anyway, so we were, and, and, wow, because of the languages and everything, um, my handle was Peacemaker. Um, which was also, I pointed out, the gun that won the White House time, <laughs> and a rather handy little missile. Um, so, we were talking back and forth, and anyway, you know, the, I mean, it was an extraordinary time. I mean, I was down there with my babies, and, and we were tearing up park benches and making barricades and playing Woody Guthrie so songs on the top of the buses in the rain and drinking water. I swear to you, that ru communism fell because of three things. MTV, CNN, and Russian vodka. <laughs> If it hadn't been for the vodka, we wouldn't have had the staying part of it. It was chilly. <laughs> and, and CNN, they got the truth for the first time after, after thousands of years of being lied to. And, and one of those, the, the worst lies was, listen, you're having the most fun in the world. And then they looked at MTV and said, no, we ain't. <laughs> um, but an interesting side story to this, too, is that we were shooting in a town called Yadislav, um, which was a... a 800, 900 year old town on the Volga River. And it was a very rainy day, I remember, and we had taken uh, refuge in one of the buses. And there's a long, I mean, you get to amuse yourself with just about anything. So I was amusing myself with watching the reflection of the raindrops down with the sunlight through the window on this guy's arm, right? <laughs> I'm sitting there looking, and he was in a t shirt and jeans and was Russian, had a huge beard, and uh, we'd kind of met and said, well, who's the art director, um, the local art director? Um, and he said, were you ever baptized? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, I, I don't remember per se. Um, something about peeing on a priest, but I don't know. <laughs> um, and that's holy water. Uh, and uh, I said, well, I, you know, to be honest, I, I can't remember. I must have been. I guess I was. And he said, well, do you know? No American has ever in the history of the Russian Catholic Church been baptized in the mother river of the Russians, the Volga. I said, no American has ever been baptized in the mother river of the Russians, the Volga? No. I said, would you like to be? I said, sure. <laughs> Why not? Uh, always up for an interesting experience. Um, and so, sure, we made a date to meet for the ne next day, and he explained to me that he was actually a Russian Orthodox priest, and that he had a, a, an 800-year-old church and congregation uh, five miles up the river or whatever, and um, I said, okay, but we have to make a deal, nothing about the devil, and I can have whatever other beliefs I have, and it doesn't mean that I'm swearing this or that, and I, I was like a contract negotiation in the universe. <laughs> you know, I just want the fun part. <laughs> And he said, fair enough. Fair enough. I said, no American usually said, we're very meticulous records, church. No American. Okay, let's go. So I show up at the back of the Volga the next day. And he shows up in t-shirt and jeans and with two little boys who are in the most beautiful, immaculate, starched, white, linen, brocaded, embroidered little robes that you can imagine. I mean, the, the only thing that was missing was like little cherub wings. And so they started dressing him, and they dressed him in the most beautiful stuff I've ever seen, literally with, with jewels embroidered into the material and gold embroidery on white, the, the whitest of linen. Um, and all of a sudden, he became a holy man. I mean, right there in front of my eyes. And so we started doing this thing, and it was in Russian, obviously. I mean, he didn't speak very much English, and their liturgy or whatever is in Russian. And, you know, blah, 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 blah. and I kept hearing, Miratvoritz, Miratvoritz. And I knew that Miratvoritz was Russian for peacemaker. And I realized that that's the only name he knew me by. And we did, he had me walk in circles, and he took these little embossed ancient gold boxes with unguents and like little, little crosses on my eyelids and on my palms and stuff. And I'm sitting there kind of going, oh yeah, yeah, it's great. 